Well, welcome everyone. Time is 11 a.m., so let's begin here. This is STAT 870, Multiple Regression Analysis. My name is Chris Builder. I'm a professor in the Department of Statistics here. Um, let's begin by taking a look at the syllabus. So typically the way that I pass out stuff like this is I'll give half of it to one person, front row, and you can just kind of snake it back and forth through the rows. While that's going around, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, so I'm a professor here. I've been here since 2003. I was actually a professor at Oklahoma State University in their Department of Statistics before coming here. Um, I'm actually a native of Nebraska from the Millard area of Omaha. And the reason why I decided to move up here to UNL was so that I could be back home. Um, so I did that nine years ago. It's hard to believe it's been that long. Uh, overall, this is the sixth time that I've taught this course. I taught it for the first time about 12 years ago. So it seems like I get to teach it you know, once every couple of years. Uh, it's a good course because it's typically, you know, everyone takes these courses in different order. Or some people take courses in different order, but this is typically a great course for uh, your first semester of graduate school if you're a, a master's student in statistics, and it's a great course to have if you're not a student in statistics and take it at any time. Okay, do, you, do we need some syllabi? There you go. So, <clears throat> again, there's my name, Chris Builder. Please call me Chris. Do not call me Dr. Builder. Again, call me Chris, not Dr. Builder. Uh, my office is in Harden Hall, 342D. If you, a chance, don't know where that is. Uh, this is a department, uh, this is the course website, which we'll be talking about shortly. Here's where Harden Hall is. It's called Harden Center on it, because it happens to be an old map. Uh, but uh, you know, 33rd and Holdridge, uh, I am in the northeast corner of the third floor of this, I guess we say the north wing of the building. Um, I'm kind of tucked away in, the, in that corner there. My office hours will be basically the hour right after this class. Uh, you know, we get done at 12.15, so I gave myself some time to walk back to class, uh, walk back to Harden Hall. So 12.45 to 1.45, the course I am open to appointments to. Uh, my web portal to all my websites is an easy to remember website, chrisbiller.com. That just simply forwards you uh, uh, to actually my physical location on the web, uh, on the UNL web servers. And the actual course website that we will be using, we won't be using Blackboard except for, for grades at the end of the semester is uh, chrisbiller.com slash stat870, or there's the actual address there if you want to go to it directly. Okay, so let me get back to the syllabus. Textbooks. Here is the book that we will be using for this class. I hope this looks familiar. Does it look familiar? Okay, good. I was a little worried there. Uh, this is a standard textbook, one of a few textbooks that are typically used for a course like stat870 and Stack grad schools across the country. Uh, it's a decent book. Note that with the book, hopefully you got a CD with it, and in the CD is a student solutions manual to the book. If you don't have that CD, take a look at the publisher's website to see if you can still download the student solutions manual. Um, it's obviously something very helpful to have when you're doing homework. Uh, I strongly recommend buying this book as well. Uh, this is Fox and Weisberg's uh, book. It um, basically shows you how to do the stuff that we're going to be doing in this class using the statistical software package called R. So we will be using R a lot in this class. This is a very useful book. And if you end up taking my static 75 course, Categorical Data Analysis, uh, a lot of the stuff that we'll be doing in that class, the R stuff, is in this book as well. So that's why it's a useful book to have. Uh, prerequisites for the course, STAT 801. What that basically just means is that you need to have had at least one STAT course before coming in here, where you've learned stuff like what is a conference, what is a hypothesis test, 
Uh, what is a probability distribution? So you just need to have some kind of stat course before coming in here. If you actually look at the prerequisites listed on the on the in the in the in the I guess the UNL course catalog, you also see stat 802 listed there uh, as a prerequisite for the course experimental design. Really, that course is not needed for this course. I don't know why it's listed there. Um, generally speaking, and other, you know, this is a standard course taught throughout the country by departments of statistics, and this course is, I've never seen it listed before, so don't worry about it if you have not had set 802. But what will be very useful if you've had is matrix algebra. What differentiates this course in a department of statistics versus, let's say, maybe a regression course that's taught in another department, there are a few of those on this campus, is that we will be using matrix algebra to be doing our calculations. Now, if you haven't had matrix, so in other words, you need to know how to multiply matrices together, for example, how to take an inverse of the matrix. Now, if you haven't had matrix algebra before, we will have a short one-day review on what matrix algebra is, give you the basics. Um, but there may be some stuff that you might have to learn on your own. Please take note of that. Um, I will not ask you to do matrix algebra calculations by hand except for in rare instances. We will use R to do all the matrix algebra calculations for us. But you at least need to know what is R doing. Um, so that's why I have matrix algebra listed there. Uh, grades for the course. Uh, we will have two exams through the regular part of the semester. Each one will be worth 25% of your grade. We will also have a comprehensive final exam that will be worth 20% of your grade. And then throughout the course we will have projects, quizzes, all that combined together will be 30% of your grade. So let's say that you got 100% on your test one, 100% of your test two, and 100% of your final exam, but you decide, I'm not going to do any projects. That means you get a 70% overall. Okay, just to give you an idea how that works. So everything is scaled to be within that percentage part there. Standard grading scale, um, plus and minus letter grades are assigned 2.5% from the cutoff. So if you get a 91.5%, for example, as your final overall course grade, that's an A minus. Uh, 88.5, 87.5 would be uh, a B plus. Um, you are required to turn in all these projects that we're going to do throughout the semester electronically to me. Simply email them to me. Um, and they need to be com completed in Word documents that's so that I can grade everything easily electronically. As you as probably have seen here, I'm using a tablet PC. Um, and this just allows me to grade really easy. Hopefully you don't see that on one of your projects. Um, now these projects that we will have will tend to be long. Not because I'm purposely making them long, it's just that they often take a lot uh, to do. Uh, there's going to be a lot of computer aspects to, to doing them. And because of that, you need to really organize these projects in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a nice manner. Uh, make them look professional looking. If I don't see that's happening, I will simply return the project to you and you will need to return it. Uh, note late projects will be accepted. Now when you do your projects, you can work in groups. You can work in groups of up to three people in this class. So you might want to start thinking about you know, who would you want to do a project with. You don't have to work in groups though, but I do recommend doing it because Group work allows you to learn from other students in this class. So I do highly recommend doing that. If you end up working in a group, though, uh, please make sure that everyone participates equally. Syllabus. Everyone needs to participate equally in that group. So I don't want to see a, a situation where you have a group of size two where one person does all the work and the other person just simply puts their name on the project and gets credit for it. Okay? If I see something like that happening where everyone's not sharing and doing the work, I will lower grades. 
Uh, as I mentioned, we're going to be using a statistical software package called R in this class. Uh, it's the most used, I think it's safe to say it's the most used software, statistical software package in academia. Uh, and in the real world, it is becoming the most used software package displacing SAS, if you've heard of that. Um, why is that happening for R? Well, it's free. Um, you can download it from the R website. Here's the direct link to the Windows version of R. Um, it also comes out in, in uh, uh, Unix versions, um, Apple versions as well. All projects, everything that we do in here must be completed in R. You cannot use a different software package, statistical software package. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I will be recording our classes during the semester. So if you've noticed here, you see a webcam that's set up here on a little small tripod. I'm using that to record uh, well, the video and also the audio of what I say. Obviously, unless I turn it around, it's not going to get the video of you guys here, but it will capture your audio as long as you talk in a loud voice. Okay, so please be aware that that is being recorded. Um, I will post these recordings to my course website after class. It's going to take me some time to do some post-processing with these recordings, so hopefully everything will be posted by, the, um, uh, by 4 o'clock when I teach my other class. Um, now, the reason why I record these classes is because it gives you an opportunity to, if you didn't understand something the first time around in class, you can now go back and review what we discussed. And if by chance you are unable to come to class, I know that will be rare, but if that were to happen, you have a backup. So please don't take advantage of the fact that I'm recording here and decide that this is your last class that you're going to attend. Okay. Um, final exam, uh, like I said, it's going to be comprehensive. There's the date, Wednesday, December 12th, 10 to 12th. This is the final exam date. So if you've already um, reserved an, uh, an airplane or a very made an airline reservation to fly back home on that Tuesday, well, you can change it now. It is, our exam is 10 to 12 on Wednesday, December 12th. So how to be successful in this course? Well, understand all the material that we will have in our course lecture notes. Uh, I wouldn't put it in there if it wasn't important. Uh, understand all our coding calculations that we do in class. Through this course will have a lot of computer work in it um, in using R. And so you need to become very familiar with how to do this stuff. Because when you do this stuff in the real world, you're not going to be doing it by hand. You're going to be doing it using a statistical software package. Complete all homework that's all assigned. I'll explain what homework is in a little bit. And of course, read the book. Are there any questions about the syllabus? Yes. Are you going to use a uh, computer or are you going to use the computer? You will be using those computers to do some stuff. Uh, in particular, and this is something I was going to get to shortly, all our tests will be computer based. So, you will be using the computers in this classroom to do your tests. The reason why I have that done is because it allows me to. Uh, assess you with the way that you would actually do regression analysis, that is, through using a computer. And so that's why we have a classrooms like this available. Does that answer your question? Okay. Um, there should be enough computers for everyone um, to use one on their own. There is no group work on tests. Uh, what else? Any, any other questions? Now, some of you maybe have had regression experience in another class. Um, if, since I know there's a lot of stat majors in here, I think it's about half stat majors, half non-stat majors. Since there's a lot of stat majors in here that are probably new to the university, uh, maybe just come in with an a undergraduate degree. If you've taken an undergraduate stat course before in regression analysis, this course is probably not one you want to take because it's pretty much going to be all review. In fact, if you've taken our STAT 450 course, 
here at UNL. Probably the only difference that you're going to see is that, at least the professor who teaches it right now, uses SAS still. Now I'm going to use R as a statistical software package. So if you've had an undergraduate stack course in regression analysis already, a full semester of it, this is not a course that you want to take. It's going to be all review. Um, if you've had a regression, a full semester regression course, maybe some other way. Um, if it was not, if, if, if it was matrix based, this may not be a course that you want to take because it's going to be too much review. If it was not matrix, matrix based, then you're probably safe from taking this course. That's not, there's going to be enough new stuff here that's going to be worthwhile for you. If any of you would like to talk to me about your background and whether or not this is a good course for you, please come see me after class. I'm more than happy to talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. Are there any questions regarding this? Okay. Let's see. Well, let's briefly talk about this course website that I've set up. Now, I admit that this course website is starting to, starting to show its age a little bit. I, this first implementation was done 12 years ago when I first taught this course, but it still serves the purpose of basically uh, uh, give, uh, allowing you to get uh, information from me uh, to, your, to yourself and also allows us to communicate as well. Uh, so this is the course website. Uh, we have a menu bar on the left-hand side, a lot of self-explanatory stuff on the left-hand side. I just want to show you some of the highlights of the course website, in particular the schedule web page here. Here you will see, based upon when I previously taught the course, a tentative schedule of when I think we're going to get to certain topics. This is tentative, so it will change during the semester. I once had a student who downloaded this at the beginning of the semester, and he said that he put it uh, on his desk, and he decided not to come to class, and was quite disappointed when he found out that, you know, like a few weeks later, we weren't doing this exact same topic that he had planned on, based upon when he had printed off the schedule. Um, so, for example, you'll notice we have tentative dates for the exams listed here. So the first one's shown for October 2nd. That could, that test will be either a, a that date or a little bit before or a little bit after. So this is just a tentative date right now based upon what I've taught this course in the past. Um, so on the schedule web page also, what I will do is after every class and I do some post-processing with this recording of our class, I will post a video link corresponding to the date of the class. So hopefully by 4 o'clock today, you're going to see uh, something you know, right up here. And it's going to, right after chapter 1, you're going to see comma, video, and there will be a link to the actual video uh, for today's class. Also, you see hyperlinks here to various documents. So for example, this chapter 1 here is our chapter 1 notes. Uh, I'm actually going to hand that out to you shortly, but in the future, I will not hand out anything that's listed here. You will be responsible to download the documents, print them off, bring them to class, or bring them on your computer to class. Okay? So this is the one class where I'm actually going to bring handouts for what we're going to be doing. Otherwise, you're responsible for downloading that stuff and bringing it with you. Um, also, you'll notice here something called a day number one quiz. We will discuss that shortly. Uh, we also discuss the listserv shortly. Here's a little help document about how to use it. And right now, we're doing the introduction. So that's the schedule web page. Uh, let's see. Let's talk about the chat room. Uh, this is just simply uh, nights before exams. What I will do is have some virtual office hours in the chat room. So if you have any last minute questions, you can stop by and ask them to me. Uh, to do the chat room, I use a, 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 pa a software package called Adobe Connect Professional that the university has. And simply to log into the chat room, you use the same login that you use for like Blackboard, 
might be called your my.unl uh, login and password, or it also might be called your LDAP pass, uh, login and password, depending upon where you print it from. So I am simply going to use my login and my, my password. I enter the room. It's fairly easy to use. And so I can come down at the very bottom here and uh, type a simple message such as hello. And there you go. So, um, you know, nights before exams, I usually have a few people show up in the chat room for additional help as needed. Just escape out of there and go back. Uh, let's talk about homework. So, the concept of homework in my classes basically means is that here are some problems that are from the book. I want you to complete them, but I'm not going to collect them, I'm not going to grade them. So you can think of this as maybe even extra practice of how to do the stuff that we're going to do in this course. To help you out, I have partial answers listed here for the homework. Now you're welcome to ask questions to me um, or during class about these homework problems, but I will not discuss them unless you have questions. Um, as added incentive for you to do these homework problems is I often will take test problems directly from these homework problems. So obviously, you'll be at a great advantage to do these homework problems for tests and even for projects. The listserv, you know, I think all of you probably have encountered listservs before or message boards before. And <coughs> what this basically is is a listserv and message board all uh, in one. So if I click on here to open it up, uh, what we basically have here are archives, in this case from when I last taught the course in 2008 and also 2006. And uh, if we click on uh, July 2012 when I was updating my website, you see a little welcome message for myself that explains, well, what do we do with this listserv? Let me just briefly read it. Um, Please feel free to post messages regarding questions on homework problems, projects, or other things relevant to the course here. Maybe a question about something that went on in the previous class, post a question here. Do not email them to me. Post them here. If you have a question about your own grade, or maybe that you're going to be absent from class, or stuff that's just about yourself that other students probably don't care about, Email those, email those questions to me. Um, if you're not sure whether to post a message to the listserv or send me an email, ask yourself, will other students benefit from seeing the message? If it's yes, post it here. If it's not, email it to them. Uh, you know, the reason why I have this set up is because, again, if one student has a question about, let's say, a, a particular problem on a project, probably another student does as well. That way, we can all learn together as one group versus me answering the same question over and over again. Also, this listserv can be used for you to post messages to, for other students to reply to, such as maybe, does anyone need another group member? Did anyone get the answer to homework problem number such and such? Post them there. So it does not necessarily have to be a message that's directly related or asked to me. It could be just to the general students in the class. Okay. So let me go back to the beginning here. So how do you post a message? Well, the first thing that you need to do is actually subscribe or join the listserv list. And to do that is fairly easy. Just click on join here. And this is already pre-filled in because I, I am a member of the list. Um, just type your name, your email address, go with all the defaults here. And for you, when you first do this, you're going to have something called like subscribe or join. Click on that, and now you have joined the list. Once you do that, then there are two different ways that you can actually post a message to the listserv. First, simply email that address. Second, you can use the web interface to actually post a message. So if I post a new message here. Uh, I can do something like this uh, for subject test message, if I can spell, and then you know type something here for my message. Come down to here, click on send, 
And now it has been posted to the listserv. Anybody who subscribed to the listserv also now has received an email with this message in it. So again, this serves both as a message board, you could say, and also a listserv all in one. I'll just simply call it a listserv. Now, in order to use the web interface, you're going to need to do a few additional things. And I explain what those few additional things are. It's fairly simple in this listserv help doc file. So you can look at that on your own or just simply uh, use email uh, to post messages. Is there any questions about that? Okay. Uh, let's see. My R web page, here are all the R programs that we're going to talk about in this course. Uh, anything that we do with R in the course is contained in one of these programs here. Uh, I recommend that you become familiar with these programs. Let's see if there's anything else I wanted to mention about the uh, website. Okay. Any questions about the website? Okay. So, let's see what's next. Let's talk about this day number one quiz. So, again, you can download it from the schedule web page. And I should have already downloaded it. Let me see. There we go. Very simple quiz. If you do do the quiz, you get five points. Um, when you're done with the quiz, email it to me. Uh, do note the file name there. You can, it might be tough for you to see. It's day one underscore quiz underscore stat 870. Please do not email me the file with that file name because that means I will get 25 students with day number one quizzes with that file name. Instead, please replace that file name with your own name. Simply, this is what the quiz looks like. Let me blow this up a little bit so you can see it better. Uh, number one and number two is just to help get you experience with the course website. Simply, number one, log on to the chat room and send a one-line message. Uh, make sure you specify your name so that I know that you actually logged on. Number two, log on to the listserv and actually join or subscribe to the list. Also, actually submit a message. Um, and then finally, number three here, as you often have on the first day of your classes, I'd like to know a little bit of information about you, so please fill that in, your name, your email, or give me some information about stat courses that you have taken in the past. Um, also, tell me about your R experience, if you have any. If you don't have any, that's okay. We will be very basic at the beginning about how to use R. So, fill this in and email it to me when you're done. The Day number one quiz is due on Thursday at class time. Any questions? Okay, if not, let's uh, begin with the lecture. So typically the way that I do class is that um, at the beginning of class, I will show you our schedule, just kind of review where we are at in the semester, and then I will ask, are there any questions? And this is the, the cue for you to ask questions about projects, tests, or past material that we have discussed. If there are no questions, then what I will do is um, start going over the lecture. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Is it from the textbook or? These are my lecture notes. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, a few things. 
So first of all, when you download these lecture notes, and I'll just do this to demonstrate, um, you download them to your computer. Oh, let's see how long it is. And so I've downloaded it to my computer. And if you open it up, you're going to see something like this. You can enable editing if you want. Um, a few notes here. First of all, I use a size 20 font, not like a standard like 10 or 12. The reason being is because I want to make sure that no matter what kind of classroom I'm in, you can see what's actually projected on the screen. So since I use a size 20 font, you probably don't want to print these off one page per piece of paper. Instead, as you can see here, what I've done is printed it off four pages per sheet of paper. Some people prefer two, I prefer four. If you're not familiar with, by chance, how to do that, how to print them off four per page or two per page, simply get to print. And let's see now. Down here you can see uh, one per sheet, and you can go ahead and choose four. Or if you can really see well, you can choose 16. You save some trees. But I, I do strongly recommend, don't do one, one per page, okay? Next, also, if you notice here, we have this big gray area here on the right-hand side. Well, the reason why that comes up, and depending upon your familiarity with Word, let me see if I can find an example here. Of course, I can't find an example. Oh, there has to be an example. There we go. Notice I had a little purple balloon there. Or that's, what, that's what Word will call it, a purple balloon. And just simply, that's a comment um, in, in Word. I use comments uh, primarily just to remind me of stuff. Uh, you're welcome to read the comments if you want, but I do it primarily to remind me of stuff. Um, so by default, when you open up a Word document like this, you're going to see these comments and balloons out there. And in fact, if you were to print the document like this, as is, you will have these balloons appearing to you. Typically, you don't want that. So to get rid of these balloons from showing, you can go up here to review. I'm using Word 2010. You can do this in other versions of Word 2. Go into review. Uh, let's see now. Show markup. Balloons. I uh, want to show all revisions in line. That's what that means in terms of the, the comments. And look what happens when I do that. You see that this appears. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay. So let's get going here. Kind of set the stage for what we're going to be talking about in this particular class. Um, so what's the main purpose of what we do in statistics? Well, what we want to do is make inferences about a population, about characteristics about the population through taking a sample. That's a re kind of a real cool thing, and that's what got me into getting uh, my PhD, in, what got me interested in getting a PhD in statistics, is that, you know, I'm interested in this, this population that might be, you know, kind of hard to define, hard to see necessarily all items, all objects, all individuals inside that population. But I still want to know something about it. What do I do? Well, I take a representative sample out of that population so that I have a more manageable set of information. And I use that to allow me to draw inferences, judgments, decisions about my population itself. Kind of a, kind of a cool thing to do. So to help set, put this into an example, this is a Example I like to use in a lot of my classes because it's something that everyone can relate to. And that is, suppose we are interested in estimating the average GPA of all students here at UNL. Now we know there's about 25,000 students here. And if we didn't have access to records and the registrar's office, we had to actually maybe ask every single person, what is their GPA so we can calculate an average? That would be a quite daunting task to have to do that. Um, 
So what we can do then is use statistics to figure this out, to estimate the average GPA. And with the statistical science, then the first thing that you would want to do is define your random variable of interest. How about we let y be a symbol to represent a random variable which denotes a student's GPA? Okay. Um, and then once we have defined this random variable, then, then we can start talking about well, what exactly my population? Well, the population would be simply all UNL students. So I'm interested in GPAs of all UNL students. And we're interested in a particular um, summary of these items in our population. And we you know, often call this summary measure a parameter. So our parameter of interest in this particular case is the population mean GPA, which we often just simply denote by the Greek letter mu, pretty standard in most intro stack courses. Um, but mu is going to be very, very hard to calculate because we would need to have every single member of our population. We know that, especially at this time of the semester, the population is actually changing a little bit because people are adding, people are dropping out of the university, and so on. So what we can do then is take a representative sample then from this population to get a more manageable set of information to work with. So let's say that this representative sample is maybe um, 100 students. And we took a random sample of, from, this pop, uh, from this population. Once we have that sample then, how about we summarize it like we would want to do for the population itself. So how about we calculate the mean of every GPA that we have now in our sample. By doing this summary measure, that's what's called a statistic. That's where we get the name for statistics, or the statistical science. And what we want to do is, let's say, calculate the sample mean GPA. And what's typically used in intro stack courses, we use our letter of interest and draw a bar on top of it. We call that Y bar. That's our sample mean. And basically, this Y bar is trying to estimate mu, the population mean. But really, where the, the, the most beautiful aspect to the statistical sciences is this right here. What we want to be able to do is, using this information that we have in the sample, draw inferences back to the population about what this population mean GPA is. And we want to draw these inferences with a certain level of accuracy. That's, that's the great part of statistics. The way that we do that is through doing confidence intervals or hypothesis tests. A certain level of accuracy about your inference. Here's kind of a diagram uh, that demonstrates what, a, what we just talked about. Um, we have this population. And imagine, let's say, 25,000 student GPAs floating around that population. I couldn't get all 25,000 in, so I put in maybe about 10. And uh, so we're interested in, in, in this big circle there of, of uh, information. And we're going to summarize it by mu, population mean GPA. Since it's hard to get at every element in the population itself, we're going to go inside the population and take a representative sample out of it. So we get a smaller circle or smaller set of information. That's your sample. And in this sample, we're going to calculate similar. Is that my computer? We're going to calculate similar summary measures, such as y bar, the sample mean, so that then, through the use of hypothesis tests and confidence intervals, we can draw inferences back to what is truly happening in the population. So that's STAT 801. That's the kind of stuff that you would do in there. In STAT 870 now, we're going to make the following extension. We're not going to be necessarily interested in just, let's say, one characteristic of the population in terms of one random variable. What we're going to be interested in is this. Well, what, what factors maybe could be related to GPA, such as high school GPA? 
You imagine, let's say, that you are in the UNL admissions office, and you are working there, and you need to decide, should I admit this student or not? Well, what would you do? Well, look back at their past history, maybe how they, let's say, for uh, admitting um, undergrads, look at their past history in high school. What was their high school GPA? You might think that you could use that to help predict how they would do in college, and then that will help you decide, should you admit them or not? But of course, it's not just high school GPA alone that one should look at, maybe ACT score, or maybe their involvement in activities and so on. So what we're going to be interested in this class is basically looking at relationships that are in the population. And we're going to take a sample to help better understand those relationships. So again, to help set the stage, suppose we are now going to use high school GPA to predict college GPA. Or you could also say, depending upon what the purpose is, you want to look at what's the relationship between college GPA and high school GPA. So now, this is what happens to our little diagram that we had before. Instead of just having college GPAs floating around in the population, now we have, for every individual that exists in the population, we have pairs of high school and college GPAs. And again, we're interested in the relationship between these, these values in the population. So we take a sample, maybe a set of 100 students, and through that sample we make judgments, we make decisions, we make inferences back to what's actually occurred in the population. So let's take a look at a, 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 num a, a numerical example. So what you will often see in my numerical example is this. I'll have a name for it, and then in parentheses at the end, I will have any kind of data set that we're using. I will have any kind of R program that we're using to do our calculations and so on. So in this case, we're not going to have an R program. We're just simply going to have a data set. It's an Excel file, and it's called GPA that contains these 20 data values. So instead of a sample size 100, Suppose maybe we only had a sample size of 20. So um, we have columns for high school GPA and college GPA. We're, I'm going to let the letter X denote high school GPA. I'm going to let Y again denote college GPA. Hmm. I don't know what I'm doing with my computer, but it's making noises at times. Make sure that the recording's working. So I have 20 students in my sample. And with our labeling here, this is just a symbol, but we need to use using these symbols. X1 is going to be, let's say, the high school GPA for student one that appeared in my sample. Y1 is going to be their college GPA. For the second student in the sample, I'm going to have X2, I'm going to have Y2. They are going to be symbols to represent their actual numerical values. And what we can do then is to plot these, the data that we have in our sample to take a look at it. And so this is what's called a scatter plot. Probably some of you have seen these before. Where on the x-axis I plot high school GPA. And on the y-axis I plot college GPA. And so, for example, student number one had a high school GPA of 3.04, college GPA of 3.1. So... Here's about 3.04, 3.1, it's right about there. And if I go over, down, well, I can't draw my lines very well. This is student number one's observation plot. So we can see we have like a scattering of points on our plot. I did this with all 20 individuals in my sample. So does it look like we have a relationship between high school and college GPA? Yeah, seems like we generally do. Please note that this isn't real data. So for example, if it wasn't a student had a high school GPA of less than one. Um, but it looks like we have a relationship. And it's the kind of relationship that we would expect. That as high school GPA goes up, college GPA goes up. But notice it's not a perfect relationship either. Because we all know there's probably other factors that would go into, you know, what how one does in college.
So we see a general trend there. And in fact, what it would be nice to do if we could is maybe if we could maybe draw a line in between those points, right in the middle of those points. That kind of allows us to see that trend a little bit better. So if you turn the page, you see that line. This is our sample regression model. We'll look at how to make this calculation uh, you know, probably shortly, if not shortly, then on Thursday. Uh, this is our sample regression model that's trying to estimate the relationship between high school and college GPA. And in fact, one can come up with an equation for that line that we just saw. So on the left-hand side there, I have college GPA and have a little head on top of it to denote that this is an estimated value. Um, then I have 0.71 plus 0.7 times high school GPA. So if I wanted to, let's say for a high school GPA of 2, I could plug that in there. So I get 2 times 1 point, I'm sorry, 2 times 0.7, I get 1.4, add 0.71 to it, and you get um, 2.11, if I did the calculations correctly off the top of my head. And so if I go from 2 all the way up to that line, and if I could draw straight over, there's 2.11. So this is a nice little equation that we have here. And again, imagine, let's say, that you were in the UNL admissions office. You had to make decisions about who do I admit or not. You could use this sample model to help make those decisions, to help decide how will this person do in college, and if maybe if your cutoff point is 2.5 for a GPA, anybody with, a, with an estimated college GPA below 2.5, don't admit. Anybody above, you admit. It's simplistic. But I would imagine that, or I hope, that the UNL admissions office has something like this that they're using. Any questions? So what we will be spending a lot of time this semester doing is figuring out, well, what is that equation? That put that line on there. You know, what happens if I also wanted to include ACT score or involvement in activities, student activities, in my equation as well? How do I do that? How do I know if my model is actually doing a good job of predicting or not? Those are the kinds of issues that we're going to be looking at throughout the semester. If you want to know more about the origins of regression analysis and the long history behind it, you can take a look at this in the book. Please note, whenever I reference the book, I will simply use the abbreviation KNN, I'm sorry, KNN, which corresponds to the author's last names. Quickly, let's just do a quick, quickly, let's do something quick. Algebra review. Uh, since we're going to be working with these algebraic equations a lot. So, just as a reminder, let's say that I want to do a plot of y is equal to mx plus b. x is going to be on my x-axis, y is going to be on my y-axis. And let's suppose that m is 2 and b is 1. If I want to plot that line, all I need to do is just simply grab some x's, plug it into the equation, you'll get a y out. So for example, when x was 0, y was 1. And we get that right there. When x is 1, y is 3. We get that point right there. Um, certain aspects of this line then, first of all, this one that you see in here is called the y-intercept. What that basically means is if x was 0, where does that line hit the y-axis? Well, it hits it at 1. So that's why you see the 1 there. The 2 in that equation is our slope. And what that tells you is how fast or how slow a particular line rises or maybe even falls. So if it's positive, the line's going up. If it's negative, it's going down as x is increasing. So in this particular case, we see our slope is 2. So what that means is that for every one unit of change in the x direction, this is how much y goes up, positive 2. Okay. So goal of chapter 1, then. <coughs> what we want to do is develop that equation that I showed you earlier for the high school and college GPA. We're going to talk about how it comes about 
why we would want to use that equation versus maybe some other kind of equation. And we're going to call this equation a model, because basically what it represents is a model of what's happening in the population. We're going to just have two variables of interest, like college GPA, high school GPA. And in this kind of a setting, people call this simple linear regression. Simple because there's going to be one variable trying to predict another variable. High school GPA predicting college GPA. Linear, this is going to be a little bit more complicated to explain right now, means that there's no parameter that will appear in an exponent or divided by another parameter. You'll see what I mean by that shortly. So again, here's our diagram of what we're doing. I don't have actual data values in this example floating around in the population sample. But notice what I have below those little circles. I have our equations that we're going to be working with. Remember in the, the previous example, I had like something like mu down there, representing that summarizes everything that's in the population. Now what we're going to use to summarize everything in that population is a model. Our model is y is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 times x plus epsilon. y is going to be what we call a response variable. Other people might call it a dependent variable, for example. Um, y would be like our college GPA. X is going to be like high school GPA. Our book is going to call it a predictor variable. This is going to be used to predict the response variable. Other people might call X um, an independent variable, uh, an explanatory variable, or a covariant. All four of those names there mean exactly the same thing. I bring them up because outside of this class you might hear it called something else. I generally try to stick with what the book does, but there's uh, in terms of notation and terminology, but um, there are some minor differences that, I will, that will pop up. So this beta 1 here is the slope. Because notice that beta 1 is very important. Suppose beta 1 was 0, would there be any relationship between x and y? What do you think? No. Because no matter what x is, nothing happens to y. So that's going to be a very important hypothesis test that we will focus on later in chapter 2, I believe, to determine is beta 1 equal to 0 or not. Beta 0 there? That is actually a zero. I think in some of my notes here, for some reason I use an O. It's, it's, it's a zero. That beta zero is like the y-intercept that we saw previously. And lastly, and so I should also mention, this: the, the beta zero and beta one, these are going to be, they are, I should say, parameters. So just like how mu was a parameter, beta zero and beta one are parameters. Parameters typically are no, unknown to us, so we're going to want to take a sample to estimate those parameters. Talk about that shortly. X is going to be a known constant. It's not a random variable, at least won't be right now. We'll talk about what happens if it is a random variable later. Basically, nothing changes. Pretty much nothing changes. But X is going to be some kind of known constant. Lastly, this epsilon here. What this is trying to incorporate is this. X isn't going to get, get you all the way to Y. It's not going to be perfect. You know, high school GPA isn't a perfect predictor of college GPA for an individual student. So what epsilon is, is what we often refer to as an error term. It basically just kind of encompasses everything else that we might not be measuring or might not include it in the model. And people often refer to this, to this as a random error term because epsilon is going to be a random variable. Talk about random variables in your very first stat class. Epsilon is going to have a probability distribution to it. Specifically, epsilon, perhaps you've seen this notation before, it's going to be distributed, it's a little tilde. Epsilon is distributed as a normal random variable with mean zero and a variance of sigma squared. 
Most of you have probably seen that kind of notation before. If you haven't, there it is for the first time. Uh, it's just a shorthand notation that people often use. So again, the tilde means distributed as. And then the n is just a, a shorthand way of people saying normal distribution, where the first element inside the parentheses is the mean. In other words, the expected value of epsilon is 0. So in other words, all these errors, on average, average out to be 0. That's an assumption that we have with our model. The sigma squared represents the variance of epsilon. <coughs> so sigma squared is going to be a number. Maybe it's 5. Maybe it's 1. And it just allows you to see how the epsilon could vary from item to item to item in the population itself. So let me just go back here for a second to when we did have numbers. What this regression model is saying is this, that here's my y. In order to get that y, I could use this. Oops, let me erase. Sorry, it's a little bit hard for me to use this computer here because the, the desk is not as high as I would like it. And I don't have any way to adjust it. So, for that particular value of y, at 3.6, what this regression model is saying is that if you know beta 0, if you know what beta 1 is, let's say you also happen to know their high school GPA, and if you knew what epsilon was, you would get 3.6. But the cool thing about this equation is this, is that this beta 0 and this beta 1 are the same for every single in this case, individual in the population itself, because they represent numerical summary measures, parameters of what's going on in the population. This epsilon, maybe I should do this as well. How about I put a little subscript i on y and epsilon to represent this? Is, let's say the i um, individual in my population. This epsilon sub i is going to also vary from individual to individual to individual. You'll see a, a diagram shortly that puts, a, puts this into a, a picture-like format. But again, what we're assuming is, is that epsilon sub i is distributed normal 0 sigma squared. This is for every single individual in my population. So notice every single individual has a mean of 0, on average, and a variance of sigma squared, a constant variance. Let's see. A little short, uh, um, little note about notation here. So the variance of epsilon is sigma squared. The way that our book denotes what you often see in other classes as var, it denotes it as sigma squared tilde epsilon um, uh, n tilde. Um, I don't, I don't. I think that's kind of poor notation, and so I will always use var to indicate a variance. And sigma squared here in this case, for this right here, again, it's just a symbol to represent a number. Okay. Also, I should mention, too, that each of these epsilons, so in my, um, my high school and college GPA example, there are 25,000 students in our uh, population. There are 25,000 different epsilons, and each of them are independent of one. And we'll discuss in the semester about well, what does this actually mean in, in terms of actual application. Can we assume that these epsilons are independent of one another? Well, you might be interested in this, the expected value of y. In other words, given an x, what would I expect y to be on average? Given a high school GPA, what would I expect on average for a college GPA? Well, that expected value ends up being this, simply beta 0 plus beta 1 times x. How would you find that? Well, depending upon your, your level of comfort with working with expected values, depends upon your background, this is how you would find that. 
Expected value of y is equal to, well, let's put in what y is. Beta 0 plus beta 1 times x plus epsilon. Then, using properties of expectations, I can break that expectation up based upon the plus sign. And then, well, what's the expected value of beta 0? Well, beta 0, remember, is a parameter. It's a numerical constant. It's like saying, what's the expected value of 3? It's 3. So, expected value of beta 0 is beta 0. Beta 1 is a constant. X is a constant as well. So I get beta 1 times X. What's the expected value of epsilon? Remember, we assume that, on average, these errors are 0. And there you go. So what this is saying is that, again, Given a particular x, I know what I would expect on average y to be. We're very interested in this equation here. You want to know what the mean of y is. Notice how this mean is a function of x. So depending upon what x is, that mean is going to change. That's the population. That's what's happening in the population. In actual application, we will never know what beta is 0. We will never know what beta 1 is. So what do we do? We take a sample. And this is what we calculate in the sample. So just like before when we calculated y bar to estimate mu, now we're going to calculate this equation to estimate the expected value of y to go to beta 0 plus beta 1 times x. Here's what the equation looks like. y hat. Notice we have a little caret sign or hat on top of it. y hat is our estimate of expected value of y. B0, our y-intercept, is estimating beta 0. B1, our slope, is estimating beta 1. This is our sample model. So before, when I showed you this right here, that red line, that's our sample model. B0 was 0.71, B1 was 0.7, and that college GPA hat is Y hat. Oops. <coughs> so, you know, what you're used to seeing in your very first stat course, you know, you're taking like Y bar is estimating mu. Or maybe, let's say, S squared, your sample variance, is estimating sigma squared, your population variance. Now, here we have an equation that's estimating another equation. Okay. Um, some comments. Again, outside of this class, you might see different notation. This is the notation that the book uses, B0 and beta, B1. But you will more often see beta hat 0 as the estimate of beta 0. Beta hat 1 as the estimate of beta 1. Um, and some people will, re will, will refer to finding B0 and B1 as fitting a model. Where that name comes from, again, if I can go back, is that notice we're kind of looking for that line that goes between the points. We're trying to fit a line between the points, so that's why people refer to this as fitting a model. We're fitting a line. Again, just terminology that others um, you may see. Okay, some other comments. So this x is a constant. Notice it's a capital X. Now for those of you who have taken a mathematical statistics class, you know that capital letters are random variables, lowercase letters are observed values. Our book doesn't differentiate between the two in its notation. Um, so, it's a capital X, but it is actually a constant. Okay, please be aware of that for those who've had a mathematical statistics class. Um, even if X was a random variable, it's actually, as I kind of alluded to before, it's not going to change things for us. All our calculations are going to be, end up being the same. We will discuss this more in section 2.11. And for those of you who are going on to step 970, um, you'll see that in greater detail. Well, I've already put to, put to sleep a student. First day, wow, that's pretty good. Please stay awake in class. You're here for a purpose. Please take advantage of uh, um, being in class. 
Um, and, and lastly, before we get to some pictures that help explain this all, um, as I kind of mentioned before, let's say that we're interested in, let's say, the ith item that's in our population, maybe the ith student of all 25,000 students. A way that we can denote this symbolically is by putting a subscript i on x, a subscript i, I'm sorry, subscript i on y, subscript i on x, and subscript i on epsilon to represent a particular individual's x, i a particular individual's y, and so on. And so you might have, for example, i is equal to 1, 2, if there's capital N items in your population, capital N, or N could be 25,000, for example. Um, we could also do the same thing with our sample here. So we could use a subscript I to represent a particular sampled value. So you can say I is equal to 1, 2, maybe lowercase n. There are, lower, there are n individuals in your sample. So with the high school college GPA example, 20 individuals perhaps. And then let's take a look at these plots here. I did not produce these plots originally. I got this when I was first teaching regression analysis out of a book. I think they're very good. They're abstract, yes, but they're very good plots to give you the pic big picture of what's going on here. So again, we have some x on the x-axis, y on the y-axis. And these green dots here represent uh, population values. So, you know, the high school and college GPA example, this could be one student, this could be one student, they're high, they're high school and college GPA pairs. In this particular plot, we have a very small population, population of size 6, or 6 green dots. Now, in order to understand in the relationship between x and y, what we could do is basically find a line that kind of goes through the middle of those points. What that line is representing is simply this. Expected value of y is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 times x. So for a given x, what would you expect y to be on average? That's represented by the red line. To get from the red line then to an actual data, actual data point in your population, so this distance right here, that's where these epsilons come in. Notice how these epsilons vary around that red line. They're not always the same. They differ based upon each item in the population. That's why then we are going to use then that epsilon is distributed normal zero sigma squared. Or my sigma squares don't always come out as sigma squares. They are meant to be sigma squares. So we can see why epsilon will be a random variable here. How this, the green points vary around that red line. We quantify that variability through a probability distribution. Now, let's take a look at what would happen in the sample. Suppose the yellow dots represent the actual values that we grabbed out of the population that are in our sample. So we grab four out of the six green dots. Using some calculations that we will discuss um, shortly or next time, what we can do is calculate now the sample model, the sample regression model. And this is what it looks like. y hat is equal to b0 plus b1 times x. I could graph it. There's my blue line that represents it. Represents it. The blue line, notice how it goes to the middle of the yellow dots. The whole purpose of the blue line, the sample model, is to estimate the red line. That's what you can call the population regression model. That's the big picture of what we do in this class. We want to know what the blue line is so that we can estimate the red line and make judgments, make inferences, make decisions about that red line. Because that red line tells us what's occurring in the population. What's the relationship between x and y? So it's a, I think this is just a great set of uh, diagrams here. I will sometimes even put these diagrams on a test and have you basically fill in what each portion of that diagram represents. Now again, in an actual app reality, will we ever know what that red line is, do you think? No. But what this diagram allows you to, to, to see better, well, what, what do we do with this blue line? What do we do with the sample regression model? Again, the goal is just to get to the red line. 
And we can see, at least the way that this picture was drawn, that that blue line is going up. You know, it has a positive slope, just like the red line is, but it's not exactly the same. Well, we shouldn't expect that our sample is going to give us exactly, you know, what's occurring in the population. Again, it's going to be an estimate. And once again, perhaps I'm repeating myself, we want to know, well, how good is that estimate? That's where confidence intervals and hypothesis tests come in because we have a certain level of accuracy that we assign to those measures, or to those methods, I should say. Okay. Well, how do we actually come up with B0 and B1? Well, through these formulas. Well, I think this might be a good place to stop so that we don't get into all these numerical formulas. And some people need to get to city campus for their next class. Are there any questions? Okay, and that's it for today.